Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Welcome, Walter, in our new set. Yes, I think this is a conspiracy theory. Mm. They've conspired to keep us locked in. Locked in, yes. I see they've, they've uh, restricted your arm movements. Yeah. I cannot move back. I cannot move to the side. I think there is a conspiracy going here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's see how it goes in this new set. We've well, how many episodes? We've had 50, right? Yes. So this is number 51. So somebody decided that our movements were too erratic and therefore they designed this new set and... Uh, and maybe this is uh, the beginning of new things. Let's see. I think we are heading for very challenging, interesting times. And I think, Martin, that uh, the earth is ripe for the harvest. Amen. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us. Lord, we need you more than ever we need you every day and every hour, and we need you in this discussion. Please open our minds and bless the viewers and us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today we're going to talk about uh, souls of men and all kinds of stuff, but we just want to give a little bit of a back flash and see what's happening in the world. Yes, there's some... Articles that came out that linking on to some of the episodes that we've had. Yes, we spoke about the, the coming persecution mm -hmm. and how they are linking the conspiracies of QAnon to uh, Adventism yes. and the Millerite movement and the last one. So we just want to add one or two interesting points to make that picture complete. Yes. So Martin, there was an article in Snopes it was a, a copy of a, a f previous article, and it is by Paul Breiterman, Honorary Research Fellow and Professor Emeritus in Chemistry, University of Glasgow. And uh, this is what it's all about. And maybe I can just also add, Snopes is usually a fact check website. Uh -huh. So everybody, if there's a, something that's out in the news and it seems a little bit odd, odd, then they are the fact checkers. So they are respected as the ones who will separate error from, from reality, yes. right? So they do d put a disclaimer on in the beginning of the article that this is not necessarily their view. But it's interesting that they want to post this type of article. So obviously they want to put the debate out there, right? Yeah, that's just interesting. So the article asks why creationism bears all the hallmarks of a conspiracy theory. Many people around the world looked on aghast as they witnessed the harm done by conspiracy theories such as QAnon. So there we have that again, right? Yeah and the myth of the stolen U.S. election that led to the attack on the U.S. Capitol building on January 6. Yet while these ideas will no doubt fade in time, there is arguably a much more enduring conspiracy theory that also pervades America in the form of young earth creationism. And it's one that we cannot ignore because it is dangerously opposed to science. Martin, <laughs> <laughs> science and scripture at loggerheads. There's a statement which says, science correctly understood mm -hmm. will be in harmony with scripture. Yes. But these days, it seems, science correctly understood, will be in at loggerheads with Scripture. Right? And then he laments the fact that in the U.S., 40% of adults agree with the young earth creationists. That should not be. No. No, that should not be. 
Such beliefs derive from the doctrine of biblical infallibility. Long accepted as integral to the faith of numerous evangelical and Baptist churches throughout the world, including the Free Church of Scotland. Now this man comes from Glasgow, mm. so that's why he mentions them in particular. But I would argue that the present-day creationist movement is a fully-fledged conspiracy theory. It meets all the criteria, offering a complete parallel universe with its own organizations and rules of evidence and claims that the scientific establishment promoting evolution is an arrogant and morally corrupt elite. Martin, this man is a chemist, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if he had studied the origin of the chemical world, then perhaps he would have more questions than answers. Now, I was a zoologist and a physiologist. I was also in medical bioscience. And I, as everybody knows, I was an evolutionist mm -hmm. most of my life, militant evolutionist until I was confronted with the facts of this parallel universe as he claims and to my great shock I had to come to the conclusion that the biblical paradigm and the biblical narrative is absolutely in harmony with what we see in nature and that the explanations that the scientific world has placed on the table are nothing other than conjectures, which cannot, and I reiterate, which cannot explain the features of the geological world, let alone the genetic or molecular world. And therefore, this individual having only been on one side of the fence, has absolutely zero concept of what the other side looks like. Mm. Now, did I lightly change my views? Was I struck by a lightning bolt on a particular day? Yes, I'm sure. No. Did I have no. a zillion questions? Mm, probably. Yes. Uh, do you think that I would accept this totally new paradigm without satisfactory answers to those zillion questions? No. I was privileged. I went to many of the sites all over the world. I traveled many continents, looked at many, many uh, phenomena, mm. many features in the world and came to the conclusion that the biblical paradigm is the only one that explains the criteria and the phenomena as we see them in the world. Yes. So this is a typical statement from a paradigm of one-sidedness. Having never studied the other side in detail, this is a an arrogance which is beyond comprehension. Conspiracy theories are always driven by some underlying concern or agenda. The theory that Obama's birth certificate was a forgery or that the 2020 US election was stolen are about political legitimacy and will fade as the politicians promoting them fade from memory. So he's drawing connections with uh, creationism and bringing it into the realm of conspiracy theories. Mm. And, uh, with the, and if re you can remember the other articles, it's also bringing the QAnon and all of that to something biblical yes. that was the Millerite movement. Correct, and they always link it to the Millerite movement. Now let's just read this one and then we'll mm. discuss that further. I fear that the creationist conspiracy theory will not be short-lived. Mm. It is driven by a deep-seated power struggle within religious communities, 
between modernists and literalists, between those who regard Scripture as coming to us through human authors, however inspired, and those who regard it as a perfect supernatural revelation. And that is a struggle that will be with us for a long time to come. Unless, of course, as we see in the world today, there are movements to address this kind of thinking mm. and to eradicate it from society. We get a re-education. We, we might have to send people like us to re-education camps. And hopefully when we're done, those running the re-education camps will be re-educated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a good point. Do you think it's possible? I hope so. <laughs> it happened to Paul. Yes. The he was sent to a re-education camp and the entire prison <laughs> was exactly. converted and baptized. Converted and baptized. Yes. yes. So let's see if we can have similar experiences we don't know. But another point, Martin. Previously, they linked the QAnon conspiracies to the Millerite movement and the failed so-called failed prophecies regarding the 2,300-day prophecy, mm. correct? And we discussed that in detail in one of the previous WhatsApps. But here, creationism is brought to the fore. Yeah. And creationism is rooted in the first week of time yes. in the book of Genesis, right? Yes, and what was the culmination of that week? The seventh day Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath. And on the seventh day, God rested, rested from all his work. Isn't that what it says? He put his autograph, not his signature. That's right. He, on the week. Uh, on creation. He put his autograph on creation. And he said, this is mine. And there are certain rules and regulations mm -hmm. which will govern this new phenomenon. And he set the Sabbath as a memorial to that creation. So can you see that this creation conspiracy theory links directly to the Sabbath? Absolutely. Now, just something interesting aside. If God is in this, and he wants to make the difference between the two paradigms prominent as is happening in the world mm -hmm. today, do you think God will provide incidences or events of such a nature that people will be confronted with the Seventh-day Sabbath issue? Definitely. You think so? Yeah. I found it fascinating to read I'm totally curtailed, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I can't swing back and I can't swing to the side. No, but now people won't get seasick. So. Uh, th they were saying <laughs> that they were getting seasick. I find it totally fascinating uh, that the lead lawyer mm -hmm. in the Trump impeachment yes. is a very staunch Jew and has made it quite plain that he will not be available on the Sabbath day, yeah. which the church, of course, calls the Jewish Sabbath mm -hmm. day, totally incorrectly because it was instituted in Eden, yeah. that he won't be available from Friday sunset until the Sabbath is over. And the whole committee must obey <laughs> because he's not available. <laughs> oh. Do you think some might be irritated by that? Yes. Could it become a prominent issue? Yes. I find these little nuances <laughs> so interesting. It is. It is very interesting. It's like Everywhere God is putting some things in there. <laughs> just, just look here. Yeah. Just look here. Yeah. Now, we're not going to give a lecture on creation and evolution. You can put a link in to the lectures on evolution creation. Mm, I will. And then people can look at those. Genesis conflict. And there's a book that's written, and there are many other books written mm -hmm. as well. This is not a debate of fools. No. And uh, there's also a book by the name of In Six Days, mm. 
why 50 scientists with PhDs from secular universities believe in creation. And uh, I'll put the link for that book as well. Put the link in and let's see that people you know, can yeah. have an opportunity to see both sides of the story. Now, I must admit that when I was an evolutionist, I would probably have written just like this professor yeah. of chemistry wrote here, mm -hmm. or like Dawkins writes, right? And uh, I don't know, have you ever read the book, The God Delusion? No. Right, it's one of the most uh, derogatory books when it comes to the Bible and religion that has probably ever been written. I think uh, Dawkins took the <laughs> took the dictionary, dictionary and chose every negative adjective that he could find and uh, applied it to to God. God yeah. But if you read the book, and I of course have read many of his books then you come to the conclusion that his understanding mm. of the issue is totally flawed because he doesn't regard the God of the Bible at all. Yeah. He takes into account only Roman Catholic teaching mm. about the Bible, which is absolutely the antithesis of what the Bible stands for. So these scientists are perhaps scientifically well-schooled, but religiously dwarfed. Yeah. Let's leave it at that. Cool. Here's an article from Fox News from the 8th of February. That's not too long ago, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Liberal media pushes QAnon as the new bogeyman post-Trump face of the Republican Party. As the mainstream media struggles to find a new identity without President Trump to criticize at every turn, critics have noticed many liberal news organizations have attempted to make the QAnon conspiracy theory its latest foil in the post-Trump world. CNN is not alone in its endless QAnon coverage as much of the liberal media is infatuated with the unhinged theory. It's interesting. Now, this is a conservative uh, news and they are also using very negative tem terminology mm -hmm. when it comes to QAnon and all of these things. Now, can we just make a disclaimer here? Some people think that we have chosen sides yeah. in terms of Trump or in terms of Biden mm. administrations. Nothing could be further from the truth. Exactly. I assure the listeners, we have not chosen side. We see the whole game as a Hegelian dialectic. If you go back and watch the episodes from episode one of What's Up Prof, yes. you'll realize that because it, we continually were showing the Trump side yes. and now we're showing, showing the, the Biden, Biden side. side. So there is no choosing of sides here. We are not influenced, hopefully, by any of the policies. There are, of course, things which we observe that are very strange, but there were very strange things on both sides, right? right? And our perspective is purely how does everything fit into the biblical Scenario. Picture. Yeah, picture? How does it fit in there? So we're not taking any side, but it is obvious that all sides are condemning QAnon. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm for to QAnon. No, we've showed that as well. So. Absolutely not. It is a tool. That, oh, that's so important. To create a mindset. Mm -hmm. And if you are linking the events, the biblical event, events of the 2300-day prophecy, the Millerite movement, mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists to QAnon, and now you are linking creationism to QAnon, QAnon there is a pattern emerging. Yes, and then you take QAnon and you do and you s 
uh, put them in a box of fundamentalists and extremists and all this, then obviously, automatically, the other ones that you link them yes. to also become part of that. And people have been removed from committees. Yes. Because they, at one time, adhered to QAnon uh, ideas, etc., etc. And Martin, is it so that, that only one side of the political divide at any given time is acting contrary to God's word? No. Or are all the kings no. of the world <laughs> in the same trouble when it comes to that? Yes. Yes. Is sin something that only affects one part of the populace and not another part of the populace? Or is sin a universal problem? Well, all have sinned and fall short of the glory. So, so we are not taking sides. We are observers in terms of how the pattern fits the biblical prophecy. Washington Times columnist and political satirist Tim Young thinks the mainstream media's obsession with Q anon has resulted in reporters and pundits who are essentially experts on the conspiracy. So this is an agenda that is being pushed. And maybe, maybe this kind of thinking will eventually be attacked with such prominence that there will be a new direction which comes out of that, almost like happened in the brainwashing that you had in political systems in the Nazi world mm -hmm. and in communism, etc. Yes. With re-education. That's the thing. It's almost as if there's an agenda to start pushing the thinking in a certain direction. Yes, and that's exactly what he Hegelianism is all about, mm -hmm. right? Because remember, with Hegelianism, you have thesis, you have antithesis, you merge them, yeah. and okay. then you have synthesis. synthesis. Mm. Now, if you want to merge thesis and antithesis, then anything that will not merge has to be eliminated. Mm. Yes. Right? Now, what won't merge? The extreme fringe won't merge. So the extreme fringe on both sides has to be eliminated mm. so that there can be a synthesis. Correct? Uh, correct. I can see this. Can you see why the picture? They, yeah, and why certain of these... All right, now I'll let's see. think about yeah. God mm -hmm. and Satan. Now there is a thesis and an antithesis, <laughs> right? Yes, correct. You have God's view, mm -hmm. you have Satan's view. I don't even want to call it thesis then because God doesn't have a thesis. You have two realities. Yes. You have a reality and you have an anti-reality. Correct? Yes. The one stands for God mm -hmm. and the other one stands anti -God. for anti-God. Mm -hmm. And depending on which side you're on, you're going to be very fervently opposed to the other side. Now, in God's system, in this conflict, can there be a synthesis? Not in God's one, no. No synthesis is possible. No. Okay, so there can be no Hegelian dialectic. No, not from his side. It's either this way or that way. Mm -hmm. Synthesis in the Bible is syncretism where you merge two opposing ideologies yeah. into a synthesis, the Bible would call that syncretism. Yes. Now, uh, does God condemn syncretism more than he would condemn the antithesis or the anti-reality? Well, he condemns truth and error mixed. That's synthesis. Correct. So the problem was that Israel in the Old Testament mm -hmm. was constantly merging two ideologies. Yes. And they were worshipping Baal in the name of Yahweh. And that was totally unacceptable to God. To God. Mm -hmm. It was worse 
than being totally apostate. Yes. And we have, we have a parallel in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I wish that you were either hot, hot. Or, cold. or cold. But because you are in synthesis, you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Yeah. So this theology of merging ideologies is not in the order of God. Never has been and never yeah. will be. And, and Satan has, well, I can almost put it, the privilege of having the extreme side and the synthesis on his side. In other words, let's take this to its logical conclusion. Mm. If you are totally for God, then you are a fanatic for God. Yeah. If you are totally for the devil, you will put Baphomet's statue up and you will make sure people know exactly where you stand in terms of your worship, right? Nice. So when you have a synthesis, mustn't that absolute be removed? Mm -hmm. Then what remains? Lukewarm. Yes. Lukewarm is what remains. Lukewarm is what remains, and that's the one that God doesn't want. And that will be destroyed. Lukewarm has to be destroyed because there is no worse enemy than a synthesis between truth and error. Correct. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's like giving you a glass of water with a dose of arsenic or strychnine in it. Mm. It looks like good water, but it'll kill you. Yes. So let's just leave it at that. Let's change gears a little bit. We've now had pandemic. We still are in the middle of a pandemic. We've had lockdowns. We have a totally changed society. We have changed to uh, freedom of thinking to shipology. <laughs> if we can phrase, <laughs> if we can coin a phrase. And what has been the result? Well, many people have come in line mm -hmm. with uh, whatever it is they have to come in line with. They have changed their mode of thinking and operating. And many people cannot handle it at all. Mm. And so we see something happening to society which is rather sad. One of the things that is happening to the world is that there is a massive increase in suicide rate. Now I know that some publications say there re really isn't a change in the suicide rate, but others are adamant that there is a change. Here is uh, an article in Herald Life, festive season, lockdown amongst reasons for increase in suicide rate. An alarming rise in suicides over the past three months in the Nelson Mandela Bay has at least one expert attributing this in part to the continued national lockdown in conjunction with the recent festive season. That was then. We're now a few months on. Here's another article. Trends in suicide during the COVID-19 pandemic. As many countries face new stay-at-home restrictions to curb the spread of COVID-19, there are concerns that rates of suicide may increase or have already increased. Widely reported studies modeling the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on suicide rates predicted increases ranging from 1 to 145%. That's amazing, right? Yeah. That's Largely reflecting variation in underlying assumptions, particular emphasis has been given to the effect of the pandemic on children and young people. Now, the United States has also seen a rise in suicides, particularly mm. in young people. And I was interested to see that Joe Biden, in one of his very recent speeches, actually said that there was a massive increase in suicides yeah. in his country. Does that tell us that people are despaired? Yeah. Depressed. Does that tell us that they have lost hope, many of them? Definitely. Does that tell us that they don't see a future? Yes. Now, 
I think it's time that we started talking about things like that as well. Is there a future? If you're a young person and your studies are being curtailed, you cannot go to school, mm -hmm. it doesn't look as though things are really very bright for you. And a young person or a child has a, a short view of life. Mm. They, they cannot necessarily bridge that gap to see, well, what could happen if. And so they live in the moment and are totally depressed. Here's an article in Politico, and it says, one quarter of young adults contemplated suicide during the pandemic. That's 25%. Yeah. That's one in four children. Mm. Isn't that horrendous? That is massive. It's Martin, where are the days when kids were playing outside with, with sticks and stones and little creatures here and little creatures yeah. there? And today, their life is totally involved in this technological world. The disconnect between people has become... Yeah, this this divide of human contact. Yes, has and even, destroyed even when they a are, lot of things. Even when they are together, some of them will sit next to each mm. other and text each other rather than speak face to face. Something has happened to society. The toll is falling heaviest on young adults, caregivers, essential workers, and minorities. Federal officials and public health experts have been warning about a potential mental health crisis stemming from the pandemic, though there's been little national data so far. States and federal government have some data showing an increase in drug overdose deaths in the first several months of the year amid lockdowns, economic uncertainty and added stress caused by the pandemic. Martin, my problem is that I have a very strong idea that it's going to get worse mm -hmm. and not better. And what is it that humanity needs in order to survive this? God. Yes, they need a better understanding yes, of God. They need a better understanding. They need something to look beyond what's going on. What is your anchor? Yes, because a lot of dreams have been shattered. Where's your hope? Parents that had dreams for their children from what they can become one day. Yes. Now that's shattered because they can't even go to school. So there must be something to put your anchor to anchor you. Yes. But these things have been coming for a long, long time. Yeah. If it weren't the pandemic, they no. would have found another reason to say that this class or that class is excluded. Exactly. Or this class is privileged and that class is not privileged. They would find arguments for any of these things. Mm -hmm. And then we have Bill Gates who warns that a next pa pandemic could be 10 times worse. Now if 25% of, of the youth is wanting to commit suicide in this way, what is 10 times more than that? There's nothing left, right? Yeah. Sometimes, Martin, I wonder whether we should be grateful that we have people with such a wealth of knowledge, like Bill Gates. He's an expert in the computer world. He's an expert on epidemiology. He's an expert on vaccines. He's an expert on predicting pandemics and the future size of the pandemics. What would we do without him? <laughs> but you know, Martin, Yes. I would like to refer you to this book mm. because I believe the ultimate expert of all things is in this book. And whether there will be a pandemic ten times worse than the present or whether there will be political reforms mm. worse than a pandemic yeah. is all written in this book. Yep. It's all written here. And therefore, I would recommend to our viewers to perhaps just take another look at this book and Definitely. see what it has to say. So, just for interest's sake, let's talk about the souls of men. Because this is what it's about. This whole issue 
is a war for the soul. That's what it is. Amen. And if you, if you are on the one side, mm -hmm. or if you are on the other side, everybody in between will regard you as part of the lunatic fringe. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. So what about the souls of men? Daniel 6 verse 5. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. That's a very fascinating statement. Now Daniel was a very high official. He was basically the prime minister, right? Yeah. One position under the king. Under the king. He was the executive officer. Okay. Did they like him? No. Yeah, his peers did not, did not like, like him, him at all. What irritated them? What irritated them about them? The law. Yes. His absolute rigid adherence to the Bible. Mm. So this is very fascinating. So this law of God is a very prominent feature, isn't it? Now, Martin, we were talking about suicides. Mm. That's people that have lost hope, right? Did Daniel ever want to commit suicide? No, he became a very old man, right? Yes, and did he, he from a young age. I mean, he was, uh, we have saw, saw now the suicide rates of young people. Yes. He was 17 years old when he was taken. Absolutely. Did he have a couple of rough experiences? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Thrown to the lions. Yes. So he had some very... Did his friends go through tough times? Yes. But they had something that anchored them. Mm -hmm. And according to this verse, the thing that anchored him was his adherence to the law of God. Yes. That's the Bible, the Torah, including the law. Now, do you think God has a cause that is of such paramount importance that he would be prepared to die for it? Yes. Do you think so? Yes. All right. Yeah. Now let's take political systems in the world. Communism. Mm -hmm. Capitalism. That's a thesis and an antithesis, right? Yep. Which has to be fused into a, <laughs> synthesis. a synthesis. <laughs> Do you think, Martin, that there were people on both sides of that divide that are so involved in that cause, be it communism or mm. capitalism, that they would be prepared to die to maintain it? Yes, and there were. Haven't millions and millions of people died because they stood for those causes? Yes. So what gives them this fervor? The absolute faith and conviction and conviction that their cause is right right, right? Mm. and anybody who doesn't accept their cause does not have a right to exist mm. do we have that same kind of thinking in the religious world yes and are some people so fervent for their cause that they will be prepared to destroy anyone who does not come into harmony with their cause yes okay so you already said that God has a cause and he will not move from his cause. He said, I will not alter what has gone out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Now, if earthly governments and earthly systems of government can be a cause that can empower people, then surely this cause that has been raging for thousands of years now is a very important cause, don't you think? Definitely, yeah. It's life and death. It's life and death. And if you have chosen to align yourself with this cause, would you be someone that says, well, I'll just capitulate, or will you be prepared to get onto the barricades, put on the battle dress and go to war? Yeah, you'll go to war. Ah, and it's only—it's not only life and death; it's eternal life and eternal death. That is the issue, and as we've already said, there's no synthesis. Mm -hmm. 
in this war. No. Now, what is the war about? We need to understand the war. Now, if we read here from this statement here, it says, I saw the nominal church and the nominal Adventists, like Judas, would portray us to the Catholics to obtain their influence to come against the truth. The saints then will be an obscure people, little known to the Catholics. Remember we discussed this mm -hmm. statement in our previous WhatsApp. But the churches and the nominal Adventists who know of our faith and customs, for they hated us on account of the Sabbath, for they could not refute it, will betray the saints and report them to the Catholics as those who disregard the institutions of the people, that is, they keep the Sabbath and disregard Sunday. Now we will discuss this one in quite some detail, and we saw that you can only be betrayed in this sense to a power that has ruling authority, right? Mm -hmm. And that the issue will be the Sabbath. Now again, we saw in our introduction that the Sabbath is definitely going to be part of all of this. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 7, there's an interesting verse. It says, If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and maketh merchandise of him or selleth him, then that thief shall die, and thou shalt put evil away from amongst you. If you have been bought by the blood of the Lamb, mm. if the price has been paid for you, are you merchandise? Yes. You've been bought. Exactly. Who do you belong to? To God. Okay. Is it important, therefore, to know whether the one who purchased you is a God of love or whether he is a tyrant? It is important. Do you think it's important? Yes, because to know if you're going to be treated like a slave or a free man. Okay. Now, is it therefore important to study the character of this particular deity? Yes. Do you have a choice in the matter? Yes. Yes. Does God force you to accept him? No. Doesn't he say that you have to accept him by faith? Yes. And that he wants you to come, he's reached out his hands mm -hmm. and say, come, but people refuse, right? Correct. Or some don't refuse. It is a choice. So this God doesn't force you. And he regards anyone who makes merchandise of men as worthy of death. Isaiah 45 verse 14 says, Thus says the Lord, The labor of Egypt and the merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sabaeans, men of stature, shall come over unto thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee in chains. They shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. Humanity in general, are they in chains? Yes. Yes. Definitely. They are in chains. Mm -hmm. They've been captured. They have been converted into merchandise. What was the penalty for that? Death. 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 And here they will come at the end and say, we want that God. Surely it must be of absolute paramount importance that humanity must understand the character of God. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Definitely, I think the biggest problem in the world is a misunderstanding of God's character. That is the biggest problem. Because how can I accept God if I misunderstand his character? Now, we spoke about creation and evolution. I spoke about the book, The God Delusion, mm. where the character of God is maligned as this monster this genocidal monster who says my way or the highway yeah. and will destroy anyone that doesn't come into harmony. Now, when you read the Old Testament, that is the picture of God that is in the minds of people, right? Mm. And taking that picture, 
you reject God. And we have theologians in the Jesus Seminar, for yeah, example. Yeah. And these people say that when you study these things, you will love the God of the New Testament, but the God of the Old Testament you will hate. Or putting it in other words, you will love the Son and hate the Father. Father. Yeah. But Jesus said, I am the Father of one. one. So is it important that we understand these differences? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does God have a system of governance? Yeah, yes. There is no government without law, mm -hmm. right? They've already changed law to legal, but that's a different <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah. That's a totally different issue. But there is a basis for God's government. And as we read about Daniel, the problem lies with the law. And we won't find anything against him unless it has to do with the law. Now, if we take the Ten Commandments, and you read, Thou shalt not kill, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bring false testimony, thou shalt not covet, etc., etc. Those are all laws that everybody will say, well, that's a logical thing to do, right? Correct. And then it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. <laughs> In yeah, six days the Lord made the heavens. That's yeah. a QAnon theory, isn't it? That's what they <laughs> claim, yes. Isn't that a QAnon theory? <laughs> exactly. In six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and, and all that is in them. That's QAnon. Therefore he commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Yeah, that's, that's what that guy did. He said the same that they've got conspiracy theories. Creationists are conspiracy theories. So all right, so now you're created. saying, excuse me, but... I believe that God created me in six days. Uh, you're in the lunatic French, right? Sorry. Immediately. But th the promise is that those that are in chains will come. The church has something to sell too, you know that. It's called the gospel. And she is a merchant. In Ezekiel 27 verse 33 we read, When thy wares went forth out of the seas... Thou fillest many people, thou didst enrich the kings of the earth with the multitude of thy riches and of thy merchandise. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Yes. So are we talking about literal fish from the sea here and things like that? Or are we talking about the gospel? Mm, the gospel, definitely. So what are the wares that the church has to sell? The gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And she went forth out of the seas. That's the nations. All the nations. And the people were filled. And you enriched kings of the earth with a multitude of thy riches and of thy merchandise. There is something to sell. There is a merchandise. John 2 verse 16 says, And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. So there's a literal merchandise and there's a spiritual merchandise. Which one is acceptable to God? The spiritual one. The spiritual yeah. one. When it comes to the church. Mm. I mean, everybody has to buy things. Yeah, yeah. You have to live. You have to have food. God is not against that. But when it comes to the message, there's a spiritual message. And the message has to do with the character of, of God. God yeah. That is the message. So, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, you know, it's absolutely imperative that we understand these things. Where are we going to? We're going to Isaiah chapter 33. Martin, my Bible is falling apart again. It's most disconcerting. Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled. And dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. God is totally against unfair practices. Using people when they never used you. Mm. Trampling on people when they never trampled upon you. Lording over people. Lording it over people. And there will be a retribution according to that first verse. It will come back on your own head. 
Verse 2 says, O Lord, be gracious unto us, we have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. People need to read their Bibles to understand where we are in the stream of time. This is a timeless book. It's totally timeless. Verse 5 says, The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high, has filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. These are the issues that matter. And just to go back to what you just said, if you read the Bible, you can see it in today's day. In your, it's timeless. That's why I agree. It's totally Everything timeless. Everything is in here. You can apply it right into what you see today. Verse 6 says, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. We need to understand God, and then we will have stability even in times of turmoil. Yeah. And this fear is not a scary fear. No. It's no. a respectful it's fear. It's respect for God. And if you have respect for someone, then you have knowledge of the way in which he acts. Mm -hmm. I was one confronted, once confronted by a superior who demanded respect. Mm. And I told the gentleman concerned that respect is earned, it's not inherited. He was not very pleased with what I had to say, but that is the case. That's how it works. If we drop down to verse 10, it says, Now will I rise, says the Lord, now will I be exalted, now will I lift up myself. You shall conceive chaff, you shall bring forth stubble, your breath is as fire shall devour you, and the people shall be as the burning of time, as thorns cut up shall they be burnt in the fire. Here's the God of vengeance, right? Don't mess with him. And this is the idea that many people have. Hear ye that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near, acknowledge my might. So God is saying, acknowledge my might. And then he has this interesting statement. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. He's addressing his own people. Yes. Okay, so this is not a question of just the outside ver world versus his world. No, he's addressing the sinners. Who amongst us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who amongst us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? That's a fascinating verse. You see, God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. And people always say, you know, when you are wrong, you're going to the hot place. No, when you are redeemed, you go to the hot place. You're going to live in the presence of burning fire, just like Daniel's three friends yes. were not consumed in the fire. So this is a very good question. Who will dwell when it comes to that time when you're standing before the mighty God who is a consuming fire? And then the answer comes, he that walketh righteously, speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hand from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks, bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. In other words, you're going to be in the very presence of God. You will see the king in his beauty, referring to Jesus Christ, mm. sitting on the throne of God. Even though that seems far off, is this hope? Definitely. Is there a condition? Yes. There's a condition. Obedience. Now if we go down a little bit further... It says in verse 22, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save, save us. us. Okay. 
So he's our judge, he's our lawgiver, and he's our king. So, if, they, if he is the judge, there must be a standard of judgment. Correct. What is the standard of judgment? His law. The law. He's the lawgiver. And he's the ruler, he's the king. Yeah. And he says to you, obey. But he doesn't force you. No. And that's the beauty. And then he's got a promise. All right. So now it will you, save you. <laughs> if you read it now in this context mm. in verse chapter thirty three, then you find that God is a consuming fire to those who go against his law. We will find nothing against him if it has not something to do with, with his, his law. law. Right? God is a consuming fire to those who go against his law. Martin, the governments of this world, are they a consuming fire to those who go against their law? Yes. Don't you go to jail? I think do it. <laughs> Definitely. Is there a possibility you could go to the electric chair? Yes. Uh -huh. Are they agitating that people must be re-educated? Mm -hmm. And when they re-educate people in some of these centers, do they use techniques of torture? Is that an acknowledged fact? Yes. Yes, unfortunately, yes. So the earthly governments have a law. And the heavenly government has a law. And God says, I'm the lawgiver. And I'm the judge. And my standard is the law. And I'm your king. And you don't have to choose me. But the consequence is, you will be consumed by the consuming fire. Yeah. If you choose me, I will protect you against the consuming fire. And you will stand in the consuming fire. And not even the, the wimp of smoke will be upon you. Right? Yes. So he's absolutely adamant that his law stands. And he calls it righteousness. Right? Yes. And if everybody kept the law mm -hmm. down to the minutest detail, yes. there would be no confusion. And if I might add, there will be no unhappiness. No, cannot be. Because a lot of people will say, um, yes, but God now says you must be part of, the, uh, uh, keep the law or you'll be part of the consuming fire. Then the next thing you have to do is look at the law and see what the outcome of it is. Hmm. Is it for bad or for good? Or is it for good? So we have to look at the basis for the government of God. And the basis is there is a system of rules and regulations which determine righteousness versus unrighteousness. If everybody kept the law out of conviction, then they would have no other gods besides him because there is no other god beside them. Yes. Right? They would not be idolaters because why would you want to worship an object or an activity if you can worship the real thing, right? Yes. You would have a certain amount of respect and you would not be blasphemous if you knew that this being actually created you. Yes. Can you see why evolution and creation is such an important issue? Definitely. Huh? Can you see why a personal God versus a diffuse pantheistic God is a very important issue? Yes. Is God... A God of relationships or is God just a diffuse essence that permeates everything, including you, making you God? Yeah. He's such a personal God that he longs for you to come and talk to him and spend time with him. So he says, come, let us reason together. Yes. And then he says, okay, I'll set a memorial. I'll set a memorial which says that I am the God that created you in six days. And I want you to rest from your regular work and to spend time with me mm -hmm. on that day because I am a personal God who wants a personal interaction with you and I'm setting the Sabbath as a memorial. Will you accept that Sabbath? Yeah. And I want it to be a delight that we can 
enjoy our time together. Isaiah chapter 58, right? Call the Sabbath a delight mm-hmm. and the Lord's day honorable. Is that uh, a law of a personal God or of a pantheistic diffuse God? Personal. And that also is not a bondage law. It's setting you free. Okay. Martin, when you were married, <laughs> did you willingly go into bondage? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you willingly went into bondage. Yes. <laughs> did you put on sackcloth and ashes <laughs> on your head on the day that you went into that bondage? No. No. I was celebrating you were celebrating because you thought there was going to be something special in this relationship right so let's say that that first table in the ten commandments tells us where we come from who we're dealing with and what our relationship is to be right Mm -hmm. pretty logical and then he says okay now having established that let me show you what your relationship should be amongst yourselves Mm. first thing that he'll tell you is you know what you came into this world and somebody took care of you. And uh, you were not exactly the most pleasant object. <laughs> <laughs> like Shakespeare put it, mewling and puking in the nurse's arm. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody lovingly took care of you and didn't find it a bondage, but a pleasure, right? Mm. Therefore, honor that relationship. Yes. Honor your father and yeah. your mother so that it may be well with you. And then all the other rules and regulations, don't harm each other, don't Somebody's worked hard for his stuff. Don't go and take it. Leave it alone. Don't don't lie to him. Don't Mm. do this. Don't go and cover it. It's very logical. Mm. And then God says, that's what I stand for. And I will not compromise what has gone out of my mouth. And I will not change it. Has somebody the right to go and change it and peddle that off as merchandise? No. Has somebody the right to kidnap you into any one of their systems and say, you're no longer bound to that system, you're now bound to my system? That's robbery. Correct. What is the penalty? Death. Death. Let's continue. So there are kinds of merchandise which the church sells. There is also merchandise that political systems sell. Mm. Now, we know that God has a political system and he, he doesn't want to force you, but he asks you to accept it. Now, Lucifer is a merchant too. It says in Ezekiel 28, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as a profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. I will remove you. Mm -hmm. There's no synthesis with this merchant. What is his merchandise? Any product of sin. Anything that is against God's law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Does he peddle the merchandise of adultery? Yes, very definitely. Does he? Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Does he peddle a counterfeit Sabbath and sells it off to you as the real thing when it is counterfeit? And everything that he sells to you looks so much more easy. Yes. It looks so, like that's more of a delight. Correct. So... When the commandments talk about father and mother, Mm -hmm. is that gender specific? Yes. So when you make rules that that specificity no longer exists and that, uh, you know, the privacy of people will no longer be respected in that regard, are you peddling a kind of merchandise in the world? Yep. Okay. 2 Peter 2 verse 3 says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. 
by captivating you with fancy words and ideologies. Are they making merchandise of you? You're a commodity. You're a commodity. Revelation 18.11 says, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. This is merchandise not only in the physical sense, but mm. also in the spiritual right. sense. There's so much merchandise out there that is not in harmony with God's word. So basically, what I'm saying here is, if you don't have a cause, then there's nothing to live for. Mm -hmm. You will bear hardship. You will suffer privation. You will go through cold. You will go through hunger. You will do anything if your cause is strong enough. Correct. And therefore, nobody would commit suicide if they had a cause that was stronger than the desire mm -hmm. for suicide. Revelation 18 verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, of all thine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of precious wood and of brass and of iron and of marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. Yeah. Now many of those items are of a religious nature. The scarlet, the color yes. that is used in the religious sense, the precious stones, the pearls, the fine linen, all of these things, the cinnamon, the odors, the ointments, the frankincense. If you go to some of mm -hmm. these churches, all of these are part of creating a spiritual milieu and selling a merchandise, contrary to God's word. Yeah and then making slaves of men and selling the souls of men. That happens in this world in a literal sense and that happens in a spiritual sense. Now the QAnon theory had much to do with slavery mm. and uh, abuse, gender abuse, etc. You know what, Martin? That takes place in the world, no matter what political party you belong to. Yeah. It seems it takes place no matter what religious affiliation you have. Yes. The news is full, of, full it. of it. You cannot categorize sin into a political system. No. Sin is sin. It's not a political party. And any political party, mm -hmm. take note, any political party, any system of government that incorporates aspects of sin as morally justified is in a state of synthesis. Correct. So you could have an absolute conservative government with absolute conservative religious attributes and they could have religious dogmas like Sunday keeping which is a merchandise contrary to God's mm -hmm. law incorporated in their system yes. and they would be synthesis. Yeah. So you've got all this morally perfect and even the Sunday Everything seems there. morally perfect Justified. but it's Justified. contrary to what God said. And you can have an ultra-liberal government mm -hmm. with anything goes where you can make laws where men and women can decide what gender they are and compete with each other on the sport field, irrespective of the physical differences. Mm. And it becomes so ridiculous that you do not even know where you are standing. That is synthesis. Still on the same page. Same page, just different standards, different norms, different laws incorporated into a system 
that is being sold as merchandise the right thing to do. Yeah. For the, for the common, common good. <laughs> <laughs> we said that at the same time. <laughs> so the question I have here, are we merchandise to Satan? And is there a tendency by our enemies to sell us to him? Yes. Is there a tendency to sell ourselves? That's an important question, yeah. right? I think, unfortunately, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. We all have a tendency to sell ourselves because we have a sinful nature. Mm. And what are the motives for such a transaction? Why would you sell yourself? Fear? Hatred, whoredom, want of recognition. These are all driving forces to embed you in his system. Let's take fear, for example, in the Bible. Pharaoh takes Sarah, Abraham's wife. Mm. And here you have these amazing words by Abraham himself. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister that it may be well with me for thy sake and my soul shall live because of thee. He's afraid that he will die mm -hmm. and he's prepared to sell his wife, in a sense, yeah. to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. now, what does Pharaoh stand for? Governments. Governments. Okay. Uh, what does the woman, the wife, stand for? Church. Church. So... Is it possible that people are willing to sell their church for fear of Pharaoh? Yes. Does Pharaoh covet the church to be on his side? Yes. Definitely. Right. If Pharaoh was an ultra-conservative, mm -hmm. then he would like the ultra-conservative churches to be on board with his thinking and with their syncretism. Yes. If Pharaoh is an ultra-liberal then he would want this ultra-liberal <laughs> church to be on his side and say, you know what, the Bible is very outdated, we have to move with the times. Correct. Correct? Yeah. It came to pass that when Abraham was in Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. You know, we must be very careful that the woman isn't taken into Pharaoh's house. Correct. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. When church and state, state come together, it's a problem. Correct. And it's an unlawful marriage. It's unlawful. And he entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses and manservants and maidservants and she asses and camels. Was he paid? <laughs> yes. His Handsomely. wife was merchandise. Is it possible that the church can become merchandise in this conflict? I think it's inevitable. It's inevitable. And then he does it again. Abimelech takes Sarah. And Abraham journeyed from thence towards the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerah. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. Same thing. I think there's a tendency to sell the church to Pharaoh. Is it lawful? No. Is it legal? They perceive it to be. They perceive it to be. And again, Abimelech took sheep and oxen and manservants and woman servants and gave them to Abraham. Was it a transaction? Yes, it was paid again. It's a transaction. It's a merchandise. Now, Isaac didn't fall far from the tree. He had the same tendencies. It seems that the next generation doesn't learn from the mistakes, right? <laughs> no. So Isaac and Abimelech, and Isaac dwelt in Gerah. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, she is my sister. Terrible, isn't it's it? Terrible. Well, actually, he wasn't lying because they were all half-sisters. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's telling a half-truth. Now, why did he say that? And it tells us there, he feared yeah. to say. He feared to say, she is my wife, 
lest he said he, the man of the place should kill me for Rebekah because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time. So how, this is a terrible situation. Yeah. Right? Do we have this today? Do I, we have situations so. where we are, the, there was a certain way of saying things and now uh, to be a little bit more politically correct, we uh, know she's my sister. She's my sister. That Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. He was cuddling her. <laughs> so he knew there was something wrong here, right? Now, who's the real husband in this church situation? Jesus. Jesus. Who covered her? Pharaoh or Abimelech, right? Yeah. King of Gera. The governments of the world will want the church in the bag. Mm. When the church is in the bag, it is committing adultery against its husband. Yeah. And in order to get her in the bag, he has to compromise the law. He has to consider her as merchandise. And if you sold someone, then the penalty was what, Martin? Death. Isn't that interesting? Death. Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife, and how saidst thou she is my sister? Why would he say that? Fear. Fear. He was willing to compromise his very relationship out of fear. Mm. Do you think many will follow that path? Unfortunately, yes. I think so. Because I said, lest I die for her. <laughs> we mustn't forget that the only way that we will be able to maybe stand is with God. Absolutely. You will not be not fearful on your own. If Abraham and Isaac had internalized that concept, they would have known that God will take care of it because God had made many promises that hadn't been fulfilled yet. Mm -hmm. So we should not submit to fear in order to compromise our faith. Correct. Again, Isaac didn't have to give up his wife. She wasn't taken up by any of the others. But again, he had flocks and possessions and herds and servants. And the Philistines envied him. If you are faithful to God, there will be envy. Mm. There will be envy. It's like the same in Daniel. Correct. Mm. And then you have the great type, the story of Joseph in the Bible. And here the motive was hatred. Do you think hatred could be a motive in the time that we are living in? Yeah. We see hatred a lot in the world today. Do you think people would be willing to sell whole people because of hatred? Yep. So he exposed the sins of his brothers and he had something which set him apart. He had the spirit of prophecy, Joseph. He had the prophetic gift. And the prophetic gift irked his brethren. Yeah. They hated him because he was upright and pointed out their sins and because of his visions he had the gift of prophecy and they hated him because of it. Mm -hmm. Let's read. Genesis 37 verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. It's amazing how often this comes Again, up, right? Yeah. Daniel was 17. Mary was probably 17. He was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now the sons of Bilhah were Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah were Gad and Asher. So Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher were not very happy with Joseph. Mm. He brought their evil report. So let's, let's make this spiritual. 
So if there is a church that says, excuse me, there is an evil report about that church, that church, that church, and that church, will they be very charmed? No. Would they perhaps be willing to sell you as a slave? Yeah, correct. Okay. Give you up. Give you up. So this is what happened. Then Joseph went and visited these brothers in the field, and they said, and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Do you think that could happen in our days? Mm. Conspiracy theorists. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Mm. They hate the spirit of prophecy. Yes. They cannot stand exactly. it. Why should these people have these visions which basically condemn what we do? Mm. Right? Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Didn't they link? the Seventh-day Adventist church to failed QAnon visions. Correct. So yeah. aren't they saying that this church is a dreamer? Mm -hmm. And what do they want to do with a dreamer? The, put it over to the evil beasts. Yes. Did they think that his visions and dreams mm -hmm. were false prophecies? Yes. Were they false prophecies? No. They were pointing out their sins. Aha. Only time could tell, right? Yes. We will see what becomes of his false visions. So they sold him. Now it's interesting, and Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not, let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Did they make merchandise of him? Yes. Then they passed by Midianites, merchantmen. This is a recurring <laughs> theme in the Bible, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. The m merchants in Revelation that hands over their power, they also will be handing over merchandise. Absolutely. And does people form part of that merchandise? Absolutely. They are dealing in the souls of men. Mm. And then the Midianites sold him in Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. So they bought him for 20 pieces of silver. Being merchant men, do you think they wanted to make a profit? I'm sure they did. Now, would 33% sound like a good profit? Yes. So could you guess, it doesn't say so, mm -hmm. that they might have sold him for 30 pieces of silver? It might sound good. Was somebody else sold for 30 pieces of silver? Yes. Well, I am, I am speculating. No, speculating. I'm not being a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. <laughs> so my question is, was Jesus sold? For 30 pieces of silver. So they... The world is even willing to sell the Creator. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Zechariah, this beautiful prophecy says, And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Joseph the type was sold, maybe for 30 pieces of silver. He was bought for 20. Mm. And here Jesus is sold for 30 pieces of silver. Verse 13 says, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And in Matthew we know, And I said unto them, Who will give me, and I will deliver him unto you. And they covered it with him for 30 pieces of silver. So here is a fulfillment of prophecy. What happens to those who make merchandise of God's people? Death. Death. Jesus paid that price. Mm -hmm. He paid that price. 
Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the piece of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value. This tendency to make merchandise of men has existed from the very beginning. And if you realize that you are not merchandise, then life has value. And when you realize that God doesn't coerce you to keep the law, but invites you to keep the law based on principle, mm -hmm. then you have something to stand for. Yes, You have something to stand for Though the heavens fall around you, you have become a soldier for a cause. And just as a communist or a fascist or a whateverist can have a cause, so you have a cause, yes, which is a righteous cause. And then you will also not feel that the law of God is a yoke. No, it's not a yoke. It's a principle. And then you'll also understand that when they say in Romans that you're not under the condemnation of the law. It doesn't mean not keeping the law anymore. It means that this, this, the transgression of the law, which means death, you're not condemned anymore with, under that because you're set free with the law. Absolutely. If you take the story of Joseph, mm. there were seven fat years, symbolized by the kine and by the corn, mm. and then there were seven lean years. And the seven lean years consumed the seven fat years. Mm. And by the end of that, those seven years, all the Egyptians had been dispossessed of everything that they owned. Mm. Yes. Do you think that could serve as a type for the times we are living in? Do you think Pharaoh will own everything? We and isn't that what the World Economic Forum said? Yes, you will own nothing and you will be happy. You've said that now at uh, least since, three um, or four times, yeah. but it is a truth every time you say it. That is what they said. So do you think it's possible that in that story there is a present reality that is encapsulated in that story? I believe so. I think it is a distinct possibility. Now the Israelites themselves, they came as free men, but then they were enslaved. Hosea and his wife is another example in the Bible. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. This is Hosea chapter 1. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. So here we have another example. One of the questions I asked is, are we willing to enslave ourselves? Mm. So fear was a motivator, right? Fear was a motivator. Hate. Jealousy and hatred mm. was a motivator. And now whoredom is a motivator. For the land has committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. So this was an object lesson. So he went and took Goma, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. And she was constantly unfaithful to him. So it's a sad reality that churches today are willing of their own accord to give up their allegiance to their true husband Correct. and go into these alignments mm -hmm. such as the ecumenical, ecumenical movement. And Goma then eventually, when you do that, out of your own free will, you end up being merchandise. merchandise. And said the Lord unto me, Go yet love a woman beloved of a friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel. There's the parallel. Mm -hmm who look to other gods and love flagons of wine, false doctrine. 
So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half a homer of barley. So one and a half homers of barley. So when you sell yourself out of your own free will for the sake of whoredom, you become a slave. Yeah. And he bought her back. And it's interesting that he bought her back for with silver and he bought her back with barley. Now barley is a symbol of the early harvest. And I think God is harvesting his people. He wants to buy back the people that have enslaved themselves through whoredom. Mm. It's time for the church to wake up. It's time for all the churches. It's time for all the religious systems of the world to wake up. If you are in Pharaoh's house, if you are enslaved by the king of Babylon, it's time to come out. So the problem, what was the problem? The problem firstly was Hosea 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me seeing thou hast forgotten what? The law. You have forgotten the law of God. Every time when you study the issue of slavery in the Bible, it has to do with transgression of God's law. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a law which says thou shalt not commit adultery? Yes. Is there a law which says thou shalt not steal? Correct. Is there a law which says thou shalt not covet? Is there a law which says there's only one God and you must worship him? Is there a law where, where he says I have a day mm -hmm. whereby you acknowledge that I'm your creator and your redeemer? And every time when that, those laws were transgressed, Israel had problems. They had problems. And every time you have a synthesis between two systems, mm -hmm. then you become a prostitute. Correct. And you become a fallen prostitute. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So what was the problem? They forgot the law of God. And so God said, I will forget you. So how do we come back into harmony with God? We have to keep the law. Go back to the law. Why? Because you're afraid of God? No, because you love Him. Because you love Him. And because the principle is fair. His principle has become your friend principle. Therefore, you're no longer a slave but a brother. Yeah, That's the principle. And then he warns and he says, Therefore, I have hewed them by the prophets. He gave them the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth and thy judgments are as the light that goes forth. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. It's not rocket science. It's not difficult. So the only other thing that is open to them is to say, let's reject the entire Bible as a myth. Mm -hmm. Then none of these issues apply. Uh, or... Let's take the first six days. That's not of nonsense. And then everything so you've got else that syncretism nonsense. again. Then you have it's full of nonsense, but it also got truth. Doesn't help. Isaiah 7 verse 8, Ephraim, he has mixed himself amongst the people. That was the next problem. Ephraim is a cake not turned. <laughs> Beautiful description. <laughs> you have to be fully baked. In other words, he's half baked. Mm. Half-baked. What is half-baked? Lukewarm. Lukewarm. He's neither hot nor cold. He's half-baked. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Exactly. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. There's the other problem. Pride. So pride being lukewarm and you know it not 
And they did not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all of this. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. Mm. They call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. Can pride be linked to t tradition? Absolutely. Absolutely. But look, look what she is. She's a silly dove. Now, a dove is a clean animal, right? It mm. was even a sacrificial animal. And she has a tendency to go to Egypt. Mm. Now, when you want to accept evolution rather than what the Word of God says, you're actually in Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. But they also go to Assyria. Assyria is the symbol of Babylon. Yeah, false gods. False religion, false mm. god. Anything but the truth. Mm. I'll either believe nothing or I'll believe syncretism. Yeah. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. What a beautiful prophecy about Jesus, right? As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam. They burnt incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms. But they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man with bands of love and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws and I laid meat unto them. I gave them food. I gave them good food. He shall not return into the land of Egypt but the Assyrian shall be his king because they refuse to return. They come out of Egypt and they end up in Assyria. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> now, this God of the Old Testament, Martin, mm -hmm. A God of love or a God of terror? Well, from all we've re just read, I can't see any terror. I see the love. So when our evolutionary friends like Dawkins tell us that the God of the Old Testament is miserable mm. and the God of the New Testament is a spineless softy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he does. Yeah, it's crazy. That's what he says. Does he have a concept of God? Does he understand judgment, righteousness, mercy, justice, law? Love. Does he understand yeah. any of these issues? And the sword shall abide on his cities and shall consume his branches and devour them because of their own counsel. God gets the blame for everything. But when things go wrong, they are themselves to blame. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. Ephraim feedeth on wind and followeth after the east wind. All kinds of religious ideologies. Anything is acceptable. You can mix yoga meditation, mm -hmm. Eastern meditation with biblical meditation. Anything goes. He daily increases lies and desolation and they do make a covenant with the Assyrians and oil is carried into Egypt. Merchandise with a false gospel. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee? In all thy cities and thy judges of whom thou saidst, Give me a king and princes. I gave thee a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. We have all this history and we are bent on repeating the mistakes. Mm -hmm. We need a cause. Yes. And our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we need to infuse humanity with this ideology that gives you a firm foundation which gives you hope and a future. 
So let's say that God permitted this great evil to expose the great iniquity. He allowed his people Israel to be handed over to the Assyrians. He allowed his people Judah to be handed over to Babylon. He allowed his anti-typical people to be handed over to anti-typical Babylon. But he does not want them to stay there. He wants them to learn something. When they realize that they've been enslaved, he wants to bring them out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And he says, flee from Babylon. Don't lust after the flesh pots of Egypt. Don't say... Numbers 14, verse 2, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and a whole congregation and said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we have died in the wilderness because it could just happen. Mm. Come out. Come out of my people. Would you agree, Martin, that the question, who do you belong to, Mm -hmm is an important question in terms of the way we should conduct ourselves in the times that we are living. Yes, I think it's the most important question of your life. The most important question. Yes, who do you belong to? Yes. That's definitely because that that is where it separates. Yes. When I was an atheist, I didn't know who I belonged to. Yes. Right? So this is the most important question. Who do you belong to? Isaiah 43, verse 1, But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Here you have creation, plus you have redemption. And you have this call. Don't be afraid. doesn't matter what happens around you. You are in the palm of his hand. And if you believe that with all your heart, no matter what weapon they forge against you, it does not matter. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What is the price that was paid for you? The blood of the Son of God. Yes, everything. He died for you. Everything. You are bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 7, 23. Be not ye the servants of men. If you are bought, then you have become merchandise. But you have been bought with a price by God. Yeah, there are two that's dealing in merchandise. God and Satan. And you have to decide to whom you are sold to. And then it's pivotal that you understand the character. And if you confuse the Old Testament with the New Testament God, then you are in trouble. When you see that the issue is an ideology, a cause worthy of standing for, when you embrace that cause, then you have found life and then you will not be bought. 1 Peter 1 verse 18, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. I think I want to end there and just re-emphasize the point. In the times that we are living, we need a cause. A cause which will enable us to endure whatever yes. the world has to throw at us. If, like we've heard, if there's a possibility of another pandemic, ten times worse, if it's Whatever comes to your, on your way. Absolutely. We have to have that cause. We have to have the cause. We must have faith in the prophesied outcome of the conflict so that we do not stare at the difficulties but look beyond them to the glorious heritage of the children of God. Yes. So let us stand together without fear and trembling 
and let us stand like Daniel stood. We will find nothing against him, except it has to do with his law of his God. And you might get thrown into the lion's den. But remember what happened to him. You might be thrown into the fiery furnace. But remember what happened to them. You might be sold as a slave like Joseph was. But remember what happened to him. These are the things that give us hope and give us a reason to live and give us the courage and the endurance that we need for the times that we are living in. Will you pray for us, Martin? I will. Our Heavenly Father, without you we can do nothing. And without you we don't want to do anything. So please help us. Help us to live our lives fully dedicated to you. Bless the viewers and bring us together again. And help us in the times ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.